Welcome to Chew the Fat. In this series, I sit down with high performance guests over their favorite meal, and we talk about business, life, and what it takes to be at the top. This is part of my journey to raise a million dollars for charity by writing a cookbook called Eat With Purpose. You can help by following the content, sharing it with your friends and family, and leaving a review. The more we do, the bigger the audience, and the greater impact we can have together. Dane Walker, founder of Rival, welcome. Thanks, the fat. I'm excited and I'm hungry and it's, uh, yeah, watching you whip up an omelet makes me jealous. So I, I, I shared with you an omelet, <laughs> although looks, uh, you know, underwhelming. However, there's a lot of skill to that. Took me a I year about this pavilion. I look at that and I see beauty because my daughter, she's three. If I cook her an omelet at home, she won't eat it. But if I take her out to a cafe and they make an omelet like this, she'll eat it. So I'm always trying to figure out like how the hell they get it so fluffy. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> dig in. Have a bite, my friend. Oh man, let's try it out. A little side of guac there for you. Oh, a little surprise in the middle. Yeah, it? absolutely. Uh, a little bit of cheese. Yeah, a little bit of cheese, a little bit of tomato. So inside is tomato, onions, a little bit of garlic. Maximum Damn. flavor. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes the simplest things are the best. Dane, yep. for those of you who don't know you, can you tell me a little bit about Rival and what it is you do? Yeah, so Rival's a, uh, a branding agency, not to be confused with, I guess, marketing and advertising, even though branding it really does play notes of marketing and advertising in it. We, we really try to sit down with companies, figure out what is their TNA, the soul of what makes their company interesting and cool and different. Um, but branding is all about differentiation, sending out, communicating, um, kind of having an opinion, a voice, a style. And we try to help companies figure out what their visual style is and what their vocabulary, vo sorry, vocabulary is. Um, and just try to help position them in the market in a way where they can get more conversion, get more attention, be more interesting, um, especially with the advent of social media. Like brands really have to work a bit harder to, to know how to be cool on social media. Um, but yeah, we do designs, we design logos, we even name companies, we build websites, uh, we come up with strategy, direction, and we put plans together to help people scale their businesses. Yeah. And I think, and I'm guilty of this too, there's so many business owners out there, whether it be early stages of business or you know, 10, 20 years in, that think branding is as simple as a logo and a name. Yeah. What's the most compelling reason you can give to the audience why they should properly invest in their branding? Yeah, I think just separating logo from brand. So if you look at what brand is, brand is a feeling you get in your gut. So like if you see, you know, a pair of Air Jordans, you get a feeling in your gut, right? Or, or something else, maybe a, a certain brand of surfboards or what have you. Um, it's the feeling you get in your gut. It's like what that brand represents. It's what it symbolizes, what it means, uh, your emotional reaction to it and how you perceive them to be. Branding is the action of manipulating that. So branding is like, how are we gonna deploy ourselves in the market to create the reaction that we want? How do we get people to feel a certain way? So if Nike's looking at the market and they're like, okay, we want people to feel like when they put on a pair of Nikes that they're more confident and they can do better sports performance because of the shoe, that activity of trying to figure out or trying to deploy that into the market is branding. Brand is how the market reacts to it. A logo is um, simply a, a, an icon or a symbol that people recognize. That's all that is. It's a, it's a tool that, you, that you'll use in your branding and it's, some, it's a way for people to recognize what your brand is. Um, but then identity is all about like, how do you roll that out into the market beyond a logo? So like an identity for Coca-Cola might be the white curvy line that they use on their marketing. It might be the colors, it might be the fonts. Um, identity is anything visual or verbal that you can see and tangibly recognize. But if you look at, yeah, brands, branding, identity and logos, they're, they're one big ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And you have to know how to use all of them to create a perception in the market, in the, in the mind of the consumer. And how did you learn to know that? Yeah, <laughs> interesting question. But um, I think, you know, I, I kind of cut my teeth in this kind of world when I was designing merchandise in a t-shirt shop. So people used to just walk past this little um, retail outlet and I would spend all day watching where people's eyes would go to try to figure out what should I put in the window to get them to walk into the store. When they walk in the store, where do they go? What do they grab? What do they buy? I was fascinated with the psychology of retail. Why? I just thought it was interesting. I think my, my brain is always trying to, to go into, for whatever reason, it, it's extremely curious. It wants to know how things work. Um, and I think when it comes to um, retail, when, it, when I first got my job in there, I just thought it was really cool 
to me, I don't know how lame this sounds, but <laughs> I was like, it's cool to have someone walk into the store and walk around and know that I played a role in creating their experience and I had a role in playing what shirt they would pick up and why they would buy it. And then I also would have to design the merchandise. So <clears throat> you couldn't just take the, the Red Hot Chili Peppers logo and just slap it on a shirt and sell it because we had to have licenses, but you could find a um, unlicensed image on the internet and you could manipulate it and create art, uh, kind of like fan art for bands. Mm. And you could print that and put it up in the shop and arguably get away with selling it. So, you know, um, I wouldn't do that these days, but like that's that's what I was doing back then as an employee. And I, I, I thought it was fascinating to walk around uh, the public and see the designs I'd come up with on a stranger's uh, on a stranger's body, like you're just walking down the beach one day and you see a hundred people wearing a shirt you designed. That's cool. I just, I just was fascinated with the creative process to get someone to buy something and then seeing them in public wearing it. It, it just was interesting to me. As and nerdy as that sounds. No, no, yeah. no. I, I like it. You're, yeah. in, you're in safe company here for nerds, so we're good. <laughs> I'm a so, giant nerd. If you <laughs> and so figured that out already. <clears throat> like, how do you hone your skills? Like, what, what's the process been from there to today to continually push the envelope? Yeah, interesting. I think, you know, I, I didn't really at that time realize it was branding. I was just a kid trying to figure out how to sell merch uh, in a retail environment. It's not until now that I look back that I was like, oh, I was kind of psychologically figuring out um, the, tr the tropes of branding. But beyond that, I started to go into different sales jobs. Um, and it wasn't until I was in another job where uh, I was working in a gym selling gym memberships that I realized that the gym on social media were posting like, you know, a dollar a day for five days. Like mm. it was very promotional content. And the business owner kept saying to me, I don't know why our content's not doing well, but we need to post more of it. And the team were reluctant to post content because they didn't like the feeling of asking for people to buy memberships. So I said to them, why don't we create content that's actually interesting for people to engage with? And they would say, well, why would we do that? Because we need to sell memberships. And I remember having this debate with, with one of my managers at the time, which what was- What year is this? This is probably going back to 20, uh, I'd say 2016, mm -hmm. 2016. And I, I pulled up my Instagram and I, I was like, here's every other gym in our town and they're all doing the same thing. And look, they have no comments on any of their content. To me, it was just kind of obvious. It was like, why don't you do something interesting? And I guess back to the t-shirt thing, it's like I, I kind of enjoyed the process of not selling a shirt and making money, but seeing it out in the public. And I was like, similarly with content, can I create a piece of content that people actually enjoy mm. and connect with? They don't know I made it, but I enjoy it if it gets a reaction. So I started to come up with these weird ideas where <clears throat> I dressed up like Crocodile Dundee <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, you know, holding a pot plant and hiding behind it in the gym. And I was like, crikey, we're going to find the biggest guy in the gym. And, you know, and <laughs> I would peel it back and be like, there he is. That's the alpha male of the gym. And I'd run over and grab him and tie him up in a rope. We just made stupid content, but this stuff went viral. Wow. And everyone uh, um, started coming into the gym saying, I saw you in that video, that was really funny. That's why I signed up. That's so good. And that's when I started to come up with other ideas. Like we you know, hired um, uh, a giant gorilla suit and we put a, a giant singlet over the top and we we're smashing protein shakes and just dancing and just doing stupid things. But one of the videos that went viral, which was, do you remember that Drake song, Kiki, Do I Love You? Mm -hmm. And everyone was opening their car door while the car was moving, yeah, you know, yeah, dancing yeah. next to the car. Um, we, we had this guy, Millsy, who could dance a little bit. We put him in the gorilla suit <clears throat> and we had him jump out of the car and dance to Kiki Do I Love You in um, a merchandise gym apparel singlet. And 480,000 people um, saw that engaged with the video. And it ended up in, in the local newspaper. And, you know, I just, I just f started to figure out like this whole idea of, branding is about creating something to creating some kind of stimuli to get a reaction. Like I would say I'm almost like a stimuli freak in a sense where I love music. I love entertainment. I love videography, photography. I love anything creative. And I was trying to figure out at the time, like how do I compile this together to, um, to get a reaction just on this, uh, gym I was working at. And it wasn't until I was working in a job after that, um, where I went to a Gary V event, um, and, I knew at the time I wanted to start a business, but Gary Vee was on the stage and in my head, I thought, you know, I have to 
you know, get out of debt before I can start a company. But Gary essentially just said on stage, you just need to shut up and start a company. And for me being a creative, I was like, well, I know how to do video kind of, you know, I wouldn't say anything near the caliber of my, my team. Like when I say I know how to edit a video, I knew how to like open up iMovie and <laughs> yeah, clip, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, that's, that's about as far as my video experience goes. But I knew, I just knew how to creatively put things together um, that got a reaction. And I just decided to start an, an agency. Yeah. The piece that really resonated with me there was when you're talking about that gym and the different way in which you went about the social media creation. And the question I have is, as I think about those different elements, they may not seem very straightforward to the idea of the branding of the gym, right? Like the, the dancing of the gorilla suit. And so what I want to bring it back for the audience is like, when they're starting or they're wanting to build traction to their social media, like how do they need to think about the connective tissue between interesting, funny ideas and still cohesive brand messaging? That's a good point. I think, you know, that's why you first, before you, I would say, arguably start producing content, you've got to figure out like, what is my brand? So if you look at Red Bull, they don't do product placement videos or content on their social page, nor do GoPro. Like Mm -hmm. if you go to both of their social channels, like if you go to GoPro's channel, it's people who use the product doing crazy stuff. Yeah. Like motorbikes, skydiving, skiing, like all kinds of interesting things. And I just, you just know a GoPro filmed it. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's not about the product. GoPro's brand is about what you can do with it. So they're they're trying to make cool content from um, the viewers. I think GoPro do, every year they give away a million dollars and then people submit their videos to try to win. It's genius. And then they just have a year's worth of like free content that they can just click and drag into into the um, social channels. But Red Bull, you know, if you look at these as examples, it's like, well, what story are they telling? Why do they exist? Um, And you'll never see product placement. I think when, you know, people start a company, they think social media is a great opportunity for me to take photos of my products or tell people about my services and basically go on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube and say, buy my shit. But no one's going to listen. So how do you get people to want to buy from you? Well, give them something. It's like when a friend gives you a gift. Mm. Like if I came into your home today and gave you a bottle of, you know, Jack Daniels and said, hey man, like, thanks for having me over. You would, part of you would be like, I want to give something back. Yeah. So I think social media is the same way. If you look at it, like it's a platform for me to give education or entertainment or some kind of value to the viewer, then I have their attention. Then, then I have a conversation between the two of us, essentially, metaphorically. Um, that, that to me is what I think people should focus on is like, what is that for me? And it's not an easy question to answer. Mm. You say, what is it? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> but that, that's brand strategy. Brand strategy is let's find out what that thing is. What is your, what is your X factor, your sizzle, the special ingredient? Um, what is whatever the hell you put in that omelet? You know what I mean? <laughs> like what, what is that thing that I haven't experienced before? Um, so you can make the same product or the same service, but like what makes it special? So let's contextualize it. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's think about the takeaways for the audience who is listening today. They may not have the, the, the finances, the resources, the willingness to invest, to make that step, to sit down with a, with a Dane Walker. Yeah. What's their first element for this brand strategy piece? Like how do they go about thinking about this? I think the the three most important questions are why, why do we exist? Who needs to know and why should they care? And even if you can't answer those questions right away, like write them down, put them on the wall Mm -hmm. and like ask yourself again and again until you can start to get some form of an answer for it. There are different ways of exercising how to get to those answers. Um, One of which I'll just share with you, like just a weird one that we'll ask in a workshop. And and we ask people, if your brand were a song, what would it be and why? Even just watching them squirrel for 20 minutes, trying to go through their playlist to figure out, is it this song or that song? Which one's the right vibe? Mm. You know, a a song can tell you a lot about a vibe. Is it high energy? Is it chill? Is it relaxing? Like you ask these roundabout ways and you start to collect these nuggets and you can kind of formulate the big three. But the big three is why does this brand exist? Uh, Who's going to care about it? And and why should they, sorry, why does this brand exist? Um, Who's it for and why should they care? Mm -hmm. So when I say, why does the brand exist? If I were to say to you, Nike, why does Nike exist? What's your answer for that? Why does Nike exist? To make people feel good as they're doing their highest performance. Yeah. Yeah. So Nike's 
reason for existing is similar to that. It's like the pursuit of greatness. Mm. It's like pursuing your dream, your goal, aspiring for something. Who's it for? Athletes. Mm. Why should they care? Well, Nike's dedicated to making athletic shoes, right? Arguably some of the best in the planet. Um, you could say that, you know, Adidas or, or the, any of these other brands could compete, Reebok, whatever. But I think in, in a lot of people's minds in the world, they're like, ah, Nike's the best. So if you're, uh, let's just say, starting an e-com store selling apparel, it's like, well, why does it exist? Well, you can't say because our product is better than the competitors. It's not interesting. You can't say because we're cheaper. You can't say because, you know, it's inclusive because everyone's saying the same thing, unfortunately. You can't say, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you have to figure out like, why does my apparel brand exist? And it has to be interesting. In Culture King's case, you know, they were trying to go, okay, well, someone who's 17, who's transforming into adulthood, wants to kind of rebel and, and signal that they're in that transition. So Culture Kings intelligently has positioned, like, why do we exist? It's to make, you know, youth feel like they're moving into maturity. That's, that's the whole, it's like Culture Kings is the chasm. They're saving up seven, $800 so that on their 17th birthday, they can go fill their wardrobe with Culture Kings, right? So, so like, why does your brand exist? <clears throat> Who's it for is really important. So, no, so Culture Kings focus on, People that are kind of thrill-seeking hedonist youth, right? I don't know if you've seen that documentary on um, uh, on Woodstock in '99 on yeah. Netflix, yeah. right? <laughs> that crowd, yeah. that's Culture King crowd, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? And then the last thing is like, why should they care? Well, Culture King symbolizes youth. It symbolizes eternal youth. It's it symbolizes alternative culture, hip hop, basketball. Um, it lives and breathes that DNA. So like, when you're building your a power brand, hypothetically, it's like, well, why does it exist? what specific crowd is it for? Because if you target everyone, you target nobody. Mm. Like Culture Kings doesn't target everyone, mm. right? It's a $600 million brand. But if you take your parents, like let's just say parents that are like in their 40s with a 17 year old, they walk into Culture Kings, the parents go, all right, here's a credit card and they walk out because the music's loud. The store's not engineered for the parents. It's yeah. engineered for that one individual. So I think too many brands focus on being too general because they're so terrified they're not going to monetize that they try to sell to anyone and everyone who's interested. But I think you become a lot more interesting as a brand if you really focus on a specific specific crowd. Yeah. That is beautifully articulated. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time I've been asked that question, so I've, I've had Damn plenty. Of, yeah. <laughs> not, not that no. way, but like I think, I think, you know, I've had plenty of time to really sit with this mm. for years mm. and figure out what the hell it is, but it's those three questions. That's awesome. Yeah. And let me dive further into that because I think one of the things that's incredibly compelling about yourself about Rival um, not only have you started you know the business relatively recently yeah but the reality is you're working with some incredible businesses and yep. incredible entrepreneurs so there we were just talking about Culture King Simon Beard yeah what's the thing that you've noticed about those people those businesses that stand out from the rest we, we yeah me and my team have been discussing this Simon Beard is he's he's an anomaly I think in many ways, and he's quite enigmatic and charismatic as, as you would know, you've I th I think spent a bit of time with him. For me, when I'm talking to someone who's, let's just say a new entrepreneur, mm. like it's their first venture um, versus someone like a Simon Beard, Simon will make a decision in seconds. Mm. So we've presented him with logos and I'm talking about like, we get on a call and we're like, here's the new Culture Kings uh, word mark and logo. And he's like, cool. He's not sitting there saying, can I see what, what other concepts did you draft up? Like he was just like, let's go, let's go. Like there's, there's very little time between him seeing something and making a decision. Whereas we have clients, you know, who will see three stellar logo concepts and they'll say, well, I just, I want to get my money's worth. Can, can you come up with some more concepts? And we're like, sure, we can do that. But like, do you like any of these concepts? Yeah, I love them. I love the first three <laughs> concepts, especially the second one. We're like, cool, let's, let's lock it in and let's roll it out. I'd really like to see some more options first. And then you present them with round two and then round three and then round four. And it's been seven or eight weeks and they still haven't made a decision. I think the biggest gap between someone who's trying to get their sea legs in business and someone who's killing it is just literally the the compression of timeframes. Like, can they compress the decision-making process and make, you know, multiple decisions back to back versus waiting eight or nine weeks? And I think maybe it's a part of fear, like I'm gonna make the wrong decision. What's the repercussions of that? I think, 
you know, someone like even Andrew Schultz, who we're working with at the moment uh, and the Flagrant 2 podcast, like we show him something, he makes a decision on the call. He's like, let's go, that's cool. I like that, that's fire. I hate that, doesn't work. Like it's just immediate confidence in backing up what they think, knowing their opinion, knowing their own gut. Um, but my advice to people who are starting is like, you know, um, to have a bit more trust in your own opinion, mm. to not worry about like, okay, Dane, can you email me the logos so I can go chat to my 18 friends and family about it? It's like, well, what do you think? It's your business. Mm. I think people need to spend more time going, I think this, therefore I'm going to execute on that. I want to add an overlay because yeah. something you've just shared there <clears throat> resonates with me so much <laughs> around that compressing the time for execution. Yeah. And I think for the, for the audience that's listening is my view on gut is – Yes, there are people who are more highly intuitive, mm -hmm. but the reality is the longer you're in business, the longer you might be in a career, the more time you spend making decisions. Yeah. And often what I find gut is truly is a way that you can subconsciously process decisions quickly. So if you don't yet have that instinct, right. Good point. start to try and reconcile. So sometimes you might have a feeling, which is this feels right. Mm. The process I would go through is I would actually sit back after, let's say this logo design meeting and I'd be like, why did it feel right? Mm. Or I'm going to hire someone. Like, why do I think that they might be good that I haven't even really had much chance to talk to them? Yeah. And so by reconciling what happens is you kind of build confidence in that gut instinct. And over time, you then become you a lot quicker to actually action and work yeah. on the gut. It's a really good point because I think sometimes it, it comes down to maybe a lack of experience or a lack of knowing how to look at things from different perspectives. Mm. So I'll give you one example, like one really easy way to, to kind of know what I mean by perspectives yep. and the angle of perspectives. Like if you take a company's name, um, let's just say uh, Nike, yep. right? It's short, right? Super easy to remember. So like if you go around a wheel of like what makes a good name, it's like, well, first and foremost, is it legally available? So I can't start a brand called Nike Pizza because Nike, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like legally it's a, it's a problem. Um, is it distinctive? Like is Nike different to the other shoe brands? And at the time Phil Knight started the, you know, the shoe sport brand Nike, like it, it sounded very different, like kind of odd, didn't sound like a shoe brand. You know what I mean? Back mm. in, back in that era. Um, then you go around the wheel and it's like, is it, um, is it memorable? It's like, well, it's super short. Like the point is you got to go around these different things around what makes a name good. It's like, well, does the name transform into symbolism? Is it easy to remember? Is it distinctive? Is it legally available? Is it um, something that's going to design well? Is it going to look good on a website? Is it going to look good on a shoe? Is it going to look good on merch? Like if you start looking at the name from all these mm. different perspectives, then you start to realize, okay, that's a good name. What I find happens when people haven't done or built businesses before is they fixate on the name sounding right. But they're not thinking about how does this how does this word translate into all these other mediums, all this other stimulation, other than just my knee jerk. What does it sound like? Because it's almost like an orchestra. Like there's so many instruments that need to play to be a part of the brands. The name is like one part of the brands. And I think what can happen as an entrepreneur is we can fixate on a tiny little thing and not zoom out and look at it. Like what about all these other ways of looking at it? So like you said, when you sit down and reflect that reflection process, is it a quality reflection process or it, does it lack quality? And I think sometimes our, our gut instincts may not be educated enough, like mm -hmm. you said, mm -hmm. but sometimes mm -hmm. I've found that like that, that gut reaction usually is weirdly correct for a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to do something selfish <laughs> and, and hopefully it's interesting for the audience. Spitball with me yeah. on the title of my cookbook called Eat With Purpose. Yeah. When you, if you had to sit back and have this zoom out process, right. like what were the first thoughts that come to your mind be? And this is a open, <laughs> honest discussion, not a uh, please Frank, oh my God. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's dive into it, man. So Ewood Purpose, so where did the name come from? So the name came from, I sat down for probably about an hour yeah. and I went, okay, who is the audience that I want to work with? Yeah. Um, and then trying to, to mold, okay, the audience is high performing people who yeah. are health conscious and time poor as well as people who may be orientated to way, to do better in the world, to do good. Yeah. And so the idea was not only do I want to tie in, of course, the food aspect of it, yeah. but I want to go, you know, people who do things in business are doing it with a mission and they're doing it with purpose. Yeah. But also when we do good in the world, we're doing it with a purpose and they're kind of boiling down to this idea that everybody, every individual needs to have a purpose. Yeah. How, how do you want people to feel uh, when they see the book? 
let's just imagine they're they're in a let me change my question where is the most important touch point that the book is going to exist in what format and subject matter is is the buying making process happening in my my hypothesis yeah. is it's across all the social media platforms. Right. So it's an online presence because it's not going to be in bookstores because I'm self-publishing. Yeah. So if you go through the process from beginning through to end, and this is for the viewers, how I want you to see your business is like, at what point does someone enter your pipeline and at what mm. point do they exit? So for example, I'll use me and then we'll come back to you. Yep. That, I'll use myself as an example and then you kind of have a blueprint to work from. So. I have an Instagram page and I produce educational content. Yep. It's good, by the way, everybody. And I just, yeah, thanks, man. I just give it away for free. I'm like, just take tips and hacks and ideas and concepts on branding. There's no real CTA, except at the moment I'm pumping my book, but that's another, that's another debate. So the pipeline is usually I make free content. People follow my page. Then usually kind of like popcorn after two or three or four months, they, you know, if they own a business, they're like, who the hell is this guy? And then they go to my website. They discover I run a branding agency. They book a discovery call. They get on a call. They meet my guy, Brad. They go through an audit process. They discover that branding is super helpful. And then they kind of go through this three-month cycle to making a decision-making process on branding, right? Um, so the for me, it's it's a long incubation period. Yep. Whereas a book, it's, it's immediate. Mm. Do I want the book or not? So for you, like where is someone going to enter your universe? Yep. And at what point are they going to see the book yep. and decide if they want it or not? So I took the exact same view that you've just shared, which yeah. is it's a it's a long process. So started the whole social media game, started yeah. this podcast, all in relation to this one goal of raising. So you a launched dollars. a social media page, knowing that you'd have to create a tribe, Correct. people that want to buy your book. Correct. So I started yeah. last year in May, so we're almost twelve months in. Yeah. Right. So so that was the idea is um, give them as much free content, whether it be about business, whether it be about food, whether it be about bringing guests on like yourself. Yeah. Bring them along for the journey. And then at the right time when the book is launched, then start to share about it. And I guess that might be what you consider my ask. Yeah. You know, 18 months in. Yeah. Usually like um, there's there's a point by which you're like, someone's going to get to this point and go, I'm going to buy that. Mm. When do you think that is? Do you think that that's listening to an episode? Do you think that's like, a, like what's going to incubate someone enough to your assumption mm. for them to go, I'm going to go to this guy's website, click add to cart, click checkout. Now that's where things get tricky. So I think I think the way I'm thinking about it yeah. is we have a bit of a pivot in terms of not pivot as such where we don't keep doing this content, yeah. But we pivot to the ask come right. September, yeah. And so like the the you know that's when I start deploying social media ads to like specifically hey here's the book and here's the compelling reason hopefully why yeah. you should purchase it at this time, um, and what is that single point? I think I guess my theory is. Over giving enough time and giving enough value, there comes a certain point in time where people realize, okay, by adding this to my cart, I get to kind of, you know, solidify myself part of this tribe. Yeah. And I know that it's 100% going to do good. It's actually not a, an ask for Frank, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you, you're trying to play uh, into what Gary Vee call, calls the jab, jab, right hook. Yes. Which is exactly. like, let me give so much value to my tribe for a long period of time. I don't ask for anything. Yeah. Uh, then all of a sudden I'm like, hey, I got a book. And then people react to that in a very positive way. And I would agree with you. So like we've been giving away content for four years and I've yeah. only asked for them to do something twice. Once when I sold a course three years ago and then once now where I'm like, hey, I got a book, jump in and grab it. Yeah. People are jumping in and grabbing it. Um, maybe they're not even going to read the book, but they're like, Dane, you've given me so much value. I've mm. just bought it to support you, right? So if you would say, okay, someone might have to be in your orbit of content or let's just say consumed 10 hours yep. of your content. Yep. What's your wild ass guess of like at what point someone would go from who the hell is this guy mm. to I want to support this guy? I, I, thinking about it and making up on the spot, I reckon it'd be like three months worth of consistent content okay. or if there was some really compelling content that like there's super, like there's particular points in time where it's right. like, okay, that's, that's highly compelling. And you had an episode recently where that happened. Absolutely. So yeah. that was Michael Crossland. Yeah. And from that, within an hour, um, one of my guests uh, who listened was like, I want to book him for a speaking gig. They yeah. booked him for a 10 grand speaking gig. And the week later, he had five people come up to him, hug him at a new talk. And they said, hey, listen to your episode with Frank. Yeah. So there's like these, I guess, these little shining lighting moments that yes. just, I think, will add to the compelling reason. Yeah. So something I'm going to touch on now, we'll come back to this maybe later in the episode, which is that episode was a tearjerker. Mm. Like you really yeah. touched on some human um, 
elements into that episode so much so that people felt really connected to you yep. and the conversation uh, to the point where they were tearing up. And this is, this is the whole point of social media. You need to emotionally engage with people, yep. you know, some way, shape or form. The, the more of those emotional notes you hit, the faster that person's going to warm up to you. It's like when you meet a stranger at a party and you have a conversation, but there's not much emotion to when you meet someone, let's just say the second time at a second party, you're like, Hey, I remember you. And there's an emotional exchange. Like, what what at what point is that emotional exchange happening that's when i find people jump the chasm from being a follower to a fan yes when they start really emotionally engaging with you so back to the book i would say the book title is not as relevant as you got it right so this is this is the tricky one is like you want to have a sick title that slaps but at the same time it's like people are most likely going to buy it not because they're looking for a cookbook but because they're a fan of you and Mm. they want to support you and play into your universe so my question for you is, is that book's language in alignment with how you feel and how you would communicate what the book's point is? Definitely. Yeah. Have you played with other title concepts? I did. So yeah. we went through, we went through a, and this is where <laughs> probably we digress from what's probably normal. Um, <laughs> we spitballed uh, probably 20 ideas. Yeah. I then uh, put a vote out to the social media world and said, you know, what's the most compelling? Yeah. And then based on those votes, I then like, kind of like stack ranked them. Yeah. And then I actually had someone in branding and marketing going, hey, what about eat with purpose? And mm-hmm. I went, oh, sh- okay, that's cool. Because then I thought about like the language from it. Yeah. But I'm very untied to it. I, I like where we're going with this. It's very interesting. Well, this, this, is, the, this is the point is like, um, you know, when I, when I wrote my book title, um, Cam's behind the scenes here, what shout, did we name it? It was like Cam. monetize yourself, which I was like, that's a sick title, right? Yeah. For my book, yeah. which is like, yeah, learn how to make yourself uh, monetize as a personal brand. Our team were like high fiving. We were like, "That's a, such a sick book title." We sent it to the book publisher Wiley, and they were like, "Yeah, do you guys have other alternative yeah. book title ideas?" And then later on, we we asked them like, "Hey, why didn't you like it?" They just felt it felt like it felt kind of tacky and cheap. And we were like, "Yeah, but that's such a hook. Like everyone wants to learn how to make money." And it's like, "Yeah, but it sounds like you're making someone uh, a piece of like." Uh, like you, you're turning people into a product. Yeah. So it's these unconscious, subconscious um, af- associations that you got to think about when you write a book, right? So recently we were naming a, um, a golfing brand and our team came up with this funny name. And it was Grasserati. Like it's kind of... Grasserati? Grasserati, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. It's kind of funny. <laughs> and it was just a concept. And, um, you know, the, to, to the clients um, that we presented to, it wasn't really kind of connecting. And we're like, that's okay. But like, why? And he's like, it reminds me of Maserati. So I think it's these unconscious associations that are usually the things we don't think about. Mm. So with the book Monetize Yourself, it was the the publisher was nitpicking the unconscious undertones of it. Mm. Is there anything unconscious, good or bad about uh, eat with purpose that that you either like or haven't unpacked. It's probably a lot I haven't unpacked. Yeah. The so it's a, this is where my bias kicks in. I I feel like there's a the undertones are really strong in terms of you know bringing those different messaging pieces together. Yeah. But I guess I should throw the question back to you: is like, what is your impression or what's your subconscious unconscious undertones that come to you? My my unconscious. Um, I like it. Mm. I love the word purpose. I like the the eat with. Mm. There's a togetherness to it. So like if I if I really and I'm not just trying to um, entertain you here. Mm. Like I, I think that it's it's actually clever. It's like eat with purpose. It's like you're eating with something else. And mm. when you're putting those three words together, they have a ring to it. It's what it's got what I call good mouth feel. Mm. Eat with purpose just kind of falls out of yeah. my face. Um, it has a nice ring to it. It does sound friendly. It does sound sound welcoming. It does sound like there's a tribe or a community mm. around it. So I would say it fits what you're doing. Um, and, you know, I think for, for that reason alone, it's just making sure that you build the rest of the brand messaging mm. around that. Awesome. I like it. I think it's great. Um, if I were to try to poke holes in it anywhere, it's... Um, uh, maybe it might be tricky with SEO. I don't know. Mm, I don't know if you've looked yeah, at that. Yeah, so we, yeah, we no. also have to look at searchability, findability. Yes. Um, can you own the .com? Can you own the domains? Um, that's just another part of it. But I think as far as like just hearing it mm. and trying to translate that into a visual system, I think it's pretty cool. Cool. Yeah. And hey, 
both Dane and audience. Thanks for letting us go on that. Hey. <laughs> nice little I, segue, yeah. <laughs> I feel like, you know, the, the reason I asked the question, probably less so, because I could ask that off, offline, right? Yeah, but yeah. I, I, I like um, kind of hearing the master at work and seeing your brain tick away and trying to, you know, put all the stuff you've talked about and contextualise it. Yeah. And I'm hoping that can be done for the audience well, as well. I think the, the point here is branding is... What branding really is, it's it's stress testing and bullying an idea. Mm, mm. And there's different stages of an idea. So our team talk about this as well. And there's a great book on this. Uh, if anyone wants to learn this, it's called Six Hat Thinking. And Six Hat Thinking essentially is um, you should look at a, uh, an idea from six different perspectives. Mm. One perspective is like facts and data. It's called the white hat. Then you go into the red hat, which is emotional uh, language. How do I feel about this idea? Does it get me excited? Then you go into yellow hat, which is like um, all of the, um, I hope I'm getting this right, like all of the positive things that can happen. But then you put on a black hat and you rip it apart. Mm. You try to break the idea. And I think so often uh, in branding, we can crush clients' dreams a little <laughs> bit because we're like pulling apart the Culture King's logo. And we're like, here's all the problems with it. And Simon's like, holy crap, man. I didn't realize that the font had this many problems. And I didn't realize, you know, like I think it's, Branding is really trying to stress test an idea to see if it works, to see if it sticks. And I think sometimes when we're building a business, we're looking at something from one perspective. We're stuck in the black hat. Mm. And we're not switching to our emotional hat or to the fact hat or to the optimism hat. We're just stuck in one way of thinking. I think to succeed as someone who's building a brand, you have to know how to swap the hats and look at your company from every possible perspective. And one example of a company that does this really well is Howard Schultz mm. from Starbucks. Every six weeks, his company sits down and they call it self-cannibalization. So they have a meeting and in that meeting, I don't know if they still do this, but they did this for a long time, which is they sit in the meeting in, in a room and they say, if we were to destroy Starbucks as its number one competitor, how would we do it? That's cool. And in one of those meetings, someone said, we'd give away free Wi-Fi. <laughs> and then they were like, well, what would happen because of that? Well, we would have people sitting in there all day ordering coffees back to back, bringing their friends in to have meetings with them. And then they were like, why don't we do that? And then they rolled out free Wi-Fi across all the Starbucks. So the point is sometimes sitting down and trying to break your business is the best way to come up with new ideas. If you're like me, you're almost sick of hearing the word AI. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it, it's it's starting to get somewhere, right? Like yeah. there's, there's definitely been some changes in, in you know, whether it be words, you know, design, branding, whatever it might be. How do you think about the tools that are available today and people who might be starting businesses, both in creative and uncreative spaces and how things are going to change? Yeah, interesting question. I think um, from what I'm seeing in the creative space, there was a bit of doom and gloom there, like oh, AI is going to take our jobs and all the rest of it. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm not an expert. I can't really comment mm -hmm. on that. But like from what I have seen and what we have done as an agency is we're certainly trying to adopt and integrate AI in a way where we're still honoring what we kind of look at as the the human creative spirit. Mm. And I think, you know, so far what we're doing at the moment is, is AI has been wonderful in like capturing data and research. And then we still have to stress test it with a human to be mm. like, is this data source from a place that's like, you know, uh, that can be vetted out and all the rest of it. But I, I think AI as an industry is moving and changing so much that there is a, there is a large degree of uncertainty. Mm. But for me, I think as a creative, part of me is... Um, it's weird. I'm, I'm at a conflict, internal conflict mm. myself, like the yin and the yang inside of me, like half of me is like, Oh, but I like the way things have been done in the past, but then the new, the new is also exciting. So mm. I think, um, from the creative space, what people have been able to accomplish mainly in the text format side of things has been interesting. Um, I still think we're a while away when it comes to visual, um, stuff, except where, you can auto crop an image now, which yep. saves an, a designer a, a lot of time. You can ideate concepts really quickly. I think it's really great in the ideation conceptualization process. And it definitely speeds all of that up from my experience. But um, yeah, part of me still kind of loves to sit down and like sketch a logo by hand, mm. you know? Yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of logos, when I walked through your office, yeah. you touched on the story, which blew my mind <laughs> around how much money some of these really large businesses spend on a logo design. Right. And I don't think many people would know that. So can you share with me uh, the particular company we were talking about? I think it was a, a, an energy company or a fuel company and the, the yeah. total quantum yeah. they spent. Yeah, so, so BP, um, British Petroleum, spent 200 and I think you'll have to fact check this, 283 million I think it was on, on their logo. Um, 
And interestingly enough, like if you're driving down a highway and you see that logo, you don't really think fuel. Like psychologically, that giant sunflower yellow looking logo kind of gives off this very eco-friendly, positive um, vibe. But if you think about like how many places that logo sits and how important it is for that logo to send a good message. Um, you know, if you think about um, what a logo does, because some people go, it's a logo, like it takes five minutes to design. It's like, well, sure, but where are all the places it needs to sit? And what job does it need to do? It's almost like you're hiring someone to communicate something to your audience and how effective that hire is. Because uh, you, you could just say, well, you could just hire anyone, sure, but we want to hire the right logo for the job. And I think, you know, if a logo sits on thousands of packages, um, you know, tens of thousands of trucks and like a hundred thousand locations, it, it's, it's kind of important to get it right. Now, usually when a company spends that much money on a logo, they're, they're designing thousands of concepts mm -hmm. and they're stress testing them with hiring groups of people to sit down and audit things. So they'll do a heck of a lot of research uh, when they do is designing a logo like that. The other one, which is kind of funny, which is Paula Scher's, uh, she designed the Citibank logo. And I think at the time, two banks were merging into one bank and she said, let's catch up for coffee. And they sat down and it's like her and the different board of directors from these different companies in a meeting. She sketched the Citibank logo on a napkin and sold it for like $2.1 million in the cafe before they even like sign the papers. And the, the point is, I think th within the design world, you've got different echelons. You've got freelancers, you've got small to medium sized agencies, you've got large agencies like Wyden and Kennedy, Ogilvy or Pentagram, which is where Paul Asher uh, works. Um, and it's these large companies that do rebrands for like Harley Davidson or the band Kiss or uh, for po politicians like Hillary Clinton. So like branding doesn't just belong in the business world, it belongs in politics. It belongs in like, um, believe it or not, different religious organizations. It belongs in governments. Like people do branding for countries, for tourism, for um, like everywhere you look, there's visual design and there's subconscious um, design as well. So even like down to how an architect will orchestrate a monument in a park or um, how a certain district of a town needs to look aesthetically to get people to traffic there, to spend money there. Like design branding and, and um, this kind of skill set we're talking about exists in so many different mediums. Yeah. Epic. Yeah, sorry, it went off the rails. No, 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 there, no, 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 no. It's good. It's <laughs> yeah. really good. And it's super interesting because I think most people wouldn't realize. Like no. when I, you know, when you mentioned 283 million, I wasn't sitting on a chair. It's but I ridiculous. Almost, I almost wanted to sit on a chair so I could fall off my chair yeah. for like for effect. Um, it's amazing. But yeah. it's, and I guess the, the, qu the question that comes into my mind is so often when people are entering, you know, small business or medium business too is like, they go to that person that's the you know the sixty bucks an hour because yeah. that person can give it to them for four hundred fifty dollars. Well, that was me four years ago. Yeah. So like just just think about this this compression of time frame. So four years ago, I sold a logo for for fifty dollars. Mm. A month ago, I sold a logo for fifty thousand dollars. In in a four year period, and it's like, what's the difference between a fifty dollar logo and a fifty thousand dollar logo? It's it's for me, it comes down to well, how important is that logo to that company, and how much money is that logo gonna mm. in in, in like indirectly contribute to the to the cause of the company and a weird one just a weird logo thing snippet here is like Phil Knight when he was presented with the Nike swoosh the first thing he said is I I don't know if I like it he actually didn't know if he liked the Nike swoosh um, and and thank God that the designer <laughs> he had was kind of like well Phil it kind of looks sick on the side of a shoe like yeah. you should just kind of go with it it's the wings of the goddess of victory Nike and it kind of works and it looks like it's a moving arc and it has a bit of um, athleticism toward it and then he went ahead with it. But if you actually just took the Nike swoosh mm. and you um, – and they did this recently. They, they estimated the Nike swoosh to be uh, worth $74 billion. Just the swoosh. If they sold just that one – like that one symbol, not because of that's what – it is on a piece of paper, but because what that means in the market. Mm. If you put that logo in the market, what does it mean? It's it's a mechanism to get people to buy things. So um, the difference between a fifty dollar logo and a fifty thousand dollar logo is like what what power does that logo have? Yeah. And when you're in your team today, like what are you are you delivering 
more or do you have more knowledge, more context of what, what helps you be able to, you know, with a straight face say that's 50 grand? Yeah, I think with, with this particular retailer, they had over 100 retail outlets uh, across the nation and they'd been in the market for 16 years. So we needed to make sure that we did our research. We did our homework and when we were pitching logo concepts, they were like, what about this challenge? What about this challenge? What about this challenge? We're like, we did the research, here it is. We did the research, here it is. We did the conceptualization, here it is. We rolled it out into different touch points. Here's the mock-ups. Like, we didn't just design a logo and put it on a page. We were like, what does it look like in a retail experience? What experience will the consumer have? Will they recognize it? Is it too much of a delineation away from the old logo? Is it familiar enough to be recognized? And with this particular logo, it's, it's innovated and uh, updated enough so people might not even notice that they've done an update. Mm. But if you look at the old logo and the new logo next to each other, it's clear as day one's out of date and one's current. So for us in our experience, it's experience. It's knowing what we need to be conscious of. It's knowing the impact it's going to have for the customer and it's putting them in a position to succeed. Um, and the customer didn't even bat an eyelid when we pitched that price. They're like, okay, let's, when do we get started? So I think the, the conversation between the person behind that and the person behind, you know, who only wants to spend $50 on a logo is what they see a logo as mm. it's not just a symbol it's it's a tool in a symphony of instruments so if you have an orchestra and each each instrument in that orchestra is a different part of your brand so like or let's just say your name is one instrument let's just say it's the cello that's your name then the um the color palette is you know the string instruments and then the wind instruments are your fonts like all of these different instruments need to kind of dance together in a way that create a perception or an idea in someone's head. So when you see the red Coca-Cola swoosh in the bubbles, you just feel happy. <laughs> it's, you don't know why, but it gives you a sense of summertime and happiness because they've been showing you these messages of people happy on the beach drinking Coke for generations. And weirdly enough, like to get to the other end of success, like logos like the Coca-Cola logo has been so successful that um, Coca-Cola have a problem and that's the Coca-Cola logo has become invisible. <laughs> it's so over seen, it's so presented in so many formats that people just started to ignore it. It's like a tree, right? So then Coca-Cola had to get clever and that's why they started bringing back the bottle shape. Yeah. Because if you just see the red with the Coca-Cola name, it just becomes unconsciously in the background. It becomes a part of the skyline. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we'd say wow. way, but yeah. yeah, no, that's awesome. That's good. I <laughs> yeah. love that. So to close it out today, yeah. your book, The 90-Day Brand Plan, yeah. has been doing incredibly well. So firstly, well done. Thank you. What would be the most compelling reason for the audience today to be able to buy that book and how it's going to help their business? Yeah, well, we stress test a lot of ideas um, when Wiley approached me and we wanted to stay true to my social media page, which is where I'm kind of known for my brand. And that was, here's an actionable thing you can go do right now to build your brand. Mm. So the book, The 90 Day Brand Plan is, is organized for someone who wants to either um, become a known figure to create a company or they own a company and they want to kind of put a face to it. Um, it's just 12 chapters to really break down the steps I believe it takes to build a personal brand. Like how do you grow an audience the right way and how do you then turn them into a monetized product or commodity um, while still respecting the audience? How do you um, own a concept in the, in the mind of consumers? How do you produce content? How do you ideate content? How do you kind of work through the different ecosystems? What is a personal brand? How do you grow one? What are the problems? Um, and, and how do you succeed at it? So we made the book super actionable where it's like essentially post content every day for 90 days mm. um, and the tools that you need to succeed in that 90 day, 90 day plan. It's kind of like a diet or like a, like a, um, like a three month workout boot camp. but for people that want to learn how to figure out the social alg algorithm and how to make content. Um, but yeah, it's really me just kind of unpacking my story from working full time at Telstra to running an agency and how I did that transition in 90 days using social media and using my personal brand. Awesome. Yeah. And the last question I want to ask you is, as we reflect on everything you've done up to date, and I can assure you, it doesn't sound like it'll be stopping anytime soon. Yeah. What are you most proud of? That's a great question, man. I just immediately think of my kids. Uh, <laughs> so I think personally, I think it's, it's you know, raising my children, but I think professionally, um, I, I feel like what I'm most proud of is, is how 
how far you can go with just being consistent. Like just, just literally just patting myself on the back and going, look, just being consistent and showing up day after day goes a long way. Like you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Everything I've talked about in this podcast, it's, you know, it's just stuff I've educated or taught myself about. I don't really see myself as any more intelligent than anyone else. I think, you know, when it comes to building a company or building a social media following, it, to me, it just comes down to just brutal consistency. Uh, and I think I'm just proud of myself for just showing up day after day, despite how I feel, despite what's happening, despite, um, you know, anything that's kind of trying to get in the way, any obstacles. It's just like, just keep showing up, keep giving value and keep helping people. Yeah. Love it. Dane, thank you so much. Thanks, Appreciate man. it. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the breakfast. <laughs> <laughs>